Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives. The only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening. And now, enjoy the show. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. What is a life of adventure? Some people seem to be forever caught up in a maelstrom of events while others go along doing humdrum tasks. Of course, what one person calls exciting is to another just an everyday occurrence. And some people seem content with what Thoreau called lives of quiet desperation. But there is a difference. Certain individuals create their own excitement. Perhaps we never find adventure unless we go looking for it. But when we do find it, the results may be quite unexpected. Are you sure, miss, that you want to get off at Foothill Junction? Of course. Are we almost there? We'll be in about five minutes. But it beats me why anyone should want to get off at the end of nowhere. The train does stop here, doesn't it? Well, sometimes, when there's a reason. You mean it's not a regular stop on this line? That's right. Not a town, you know. Just a crossroad. No stores? No post office? Nothing but the station. Well, I may be living there for quite a while. But nobody lives in Foothill Junction. My uncle does. Your uncle? Yes, Uncle Caleb, the station master. You... you're staying with him? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, that's... that's hard to believe. Our mystery drama, Stairway to Oblivion, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elizabeth Pennell and stars Anne Shepard. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. true that Julia had spent most of her life in the city, and at age 35, she gave every appearance of being a sophisticated woman quite able to take care of herself. Yet to an outsider, it might seem odd that she was stepping off a train at what looked like an abandoned station. But Julia had her reasons. For the past three years, she had cared for her ailing father. Now he was dead, and before taking up a new life, she wanted to satisfy a long-time curiosity to visit her one remaining relative, an uncle she has never met, but with whom she has corresponded. I always wondered why my father was reluctant to talk about his older brother. He never bothered to listen when I tried to read him excerpts from Uncle Caleb's letters. The past few weeks had been difficult. Disposing of family possessions and selling a big house. I was tired. I needed a respite. The idea of spending a quiet time on a remote mountaintop was very appealing. Well, we're here, miss. Hey, I'll help you with your bag. Thank you. I don't see Caleb. Must be inside the station house. What is a lapidated building? Yeah, it should be torn down. All we need here is a switch box. Uh, you wait. I'll see if I can find the old man. Caleb? Caleb? Here you are. Why is the train stopping? You're two minutes late. Caleb, we have a very special passenger. What's that? A passenger? Yeah. Lady says she's your niece. Julia? But not today. It's next week she's coming. Next week. She's waiting for you right now here on the platform. Oh, dear me. Julia? <laughs> Julia, my dear, forgive me, but I thought it was next week you were coming. Hello, Uncle Caleb. 
told me you said it in your letter. Are you sure I... you'll be all right, miss? Of course she's all right. Now give me those bags and get going. Train's five minutes late. Oh, Uncle Caleb, it's good to meet you at last. I'm sorry if there's some mistake about the date of my arrival. Oh, it's all my fault. Months and days have a way of all blending together up where I live. Afraid I've brought quite a bit of luggage. My clothes and some books for you are in that big one. Do we have far to go? Yeah, straight up those stairs. <gasps> oh. That stairway looks as though it goes on forever. <laughs> Just about. I told you I'd live down top of the world. <clears throat> this bag of yours is mighty heavy. Oh, well, wait, per perhaps if we carried it together. Well, uh, I'm afraid we can't manage everything at once. I'll... I just locked the big bag up in the station house. But, Uncle Caleb, all my clothes are in there. Now, don't worry about that. We'll get them tomorrow. You take the little bag and start up the stairs very slowly. I'll catch up with you. Sixty-eight. Nine. Seventy. <laughs> and plenty more to go. You climb these stairs every day? Well, you get used to them. Uh, here's the one resting place. Oh, I see a path leading off there. Where's that go? Uh, just off in the woods. Now, take a look at the view. Oh, it's breathtaking. Or maybe it's just the climb that's taking my breath away. Yeah, we'll be there in a moment now. Just keep going. Mm -hmm. You see? That's my house. It sort of comes at you all of a sudden. Oh. Oh, careful! Oh. <laughs> Should have warned you about that stone. Uh, looks like a marker. Yeah, that it is. Read what it says. O B L. Oblivion. Yeah, that's the name of my Hathaway. Very appropriate, don't you think? Ah, uh, I guess so. It's rather frightening. Uncle Caleb, it's fantastic. <laughs> I thought you'd like it. The books. And a laboratory, too. What are you doing with those... those bottles and things? Oh, I, uh, I like to potter with my pots and potions. Uh, bugs and toads in those jars, but... Oh, dear me, I... I know you'd like to freshen up, but I haven't even got the towels ready. Don't you worry about anything, Uncle Caleb. I'm pretty good at foraging for myself. Whatever there is to do, please let me help you. Uh, the bedrooms are down that way, and... Uh, oh, excuse me, I... I just remembered. I left poor crepe hanger shut up in the basement. I knew about crepe hanger. I was eager to see the rest of the house. A long hallway opened off the living room with uneven floorboards and many doors, all of them closed. I moved cautiously, and then, at the very end of the hall, one door was ajar. I went in, expecting the worst. But my sagging spirit soared. It was a bright, cheerful room with a window and a view. I knew it wasn't Uncle Caleb's bedroom, even though a pair of well-worn jeans hung over the back of a chair. But my uncle was calling me, and I hurried to tell him I'd found my room. Well, here she is. Creep hang up. This is Julia. What a beautiful, beautiful cat. <laughs> you see, she, she knows you're a member of the family. And now, my dear, I'm going to show you to your room. Oh, I've already found it. You found Julia's room? The one at the very end. The door was open and I went in. Uh, no, my dear, that uh, that room is not for you. Oh, but it looks so comfortable. And it has such a nice view. Uh, you haven't seen your Aunt Julia's room. That's the only place for the woman of the house. Well, Aunt Julia never lived in this house. Oh, no, my dear. Your Aunt Julia's been dead for 20 years. But she would have liked her room. And so will you. Through this door here. It looks like my grandmother's bedroom when I was a child. And some of the same furniture. I've been saving it for you. You wanted a view? 
Now, look out here. Oh, you never wrote me about your garden. Well, it's at its best just before sundown. And now, at last, I bid you truly welcome. And as you can see, you have come home. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. The dresser reminded me of my mother's. And feeling like a child, I stealthily opened the top drawer and... Oh, Uncle Ken! What's the matter? Julia, what is it? I, I opened this drawer. There's a whole nest of baby mice. Well, yes, yes, of course. And we mustn't disturb them. Disturb them? I don't like mice. Now, now, Julia, the mice are happy here. It's the perfect place for a nest. Crepe hanger can't get them. And they'll never bother you. It's always a great comfort to have living creatures in the house. Uncle Caleb took me into the rear of the garden. Dark trees rose in the background, but there was a wide, clear space laid out in plots and pathways. And there was a marvelous fragrance in the air. And I hope you'll spend a great deal of time out here. It's an herb garden. Oh, it's charming. Let's see, that's thyme. And this is sage. Oh, I'm a classicist. Now, there's rosemary mm -hmm. and uh, rue. And this is comfrey. Very good for healing cuts and bruises. Uh, what an array. And here's what I call my poison plot. Well, it doesn't look very sinister. Lily of the Valley, Larkspur, Jack in the Pulpit, Iris, and Buttercups. Deadly poison. Every one. Oh. <laughs> Uncle, you're joking. I noticed these from the window. But I'm relieved to see that they're not gravestones, just natural outcroppings of rock. Forgive me, but from a distance, there's something about the way your garden's laid out made it look like a cemetery. Oh, I planned it that way. Oh, Uncle Kate, you're a ghoul. Now, don't laugh. This is a proper graveyard, all right. And someday, my Julia and I will be laid to rest here, side by side. <laughs> His words were strange. And after I went to bed, I tossed and turned for hours, ridden with horrible nightmares. I woke late, dressed, and headed down the hallway. Good morning, Crepe Anger. Where's my uncle? I went into the surprisingly modern kitchen, efficient like a hospital, except that the many shelves were filled with herbs and spices. The makings for a substantial breakfast were on the table, and there was a note from Uncle Caleb which said, I'll be back at 11.30. You know your way to the garden, but please do not, in big capital letters, open any other doors. I'll explain later. Well, he needn't worry. I was not about to pry. But I did want to get outside, and my clothes seemed all wrong for country wear. Then I remembered the jeans in the front room. If that door was still open, I wouldn't be breaking any rules. It was. Just as it'd been the day before. And I snatched up the jeans from the back of that chair. Just my size if I rolled up the bottom. I didn't stop to wonder who they might belong to, for now they were mine. When Uncle Caleb came back, I was happily kneeling in the garden trying to identify the herd. Julia! Julia! I'm out in the garden. Well, I, I'm glad to see... Julia. Yes, Uncle Caleb. Where did you get those... Those... Those what? That disgraceful pair of pants. Oh, I saw them yesterday in that back room there. Well, take them off at once. Well, I will if you've brought my suitcase. I have a couple of pairs of slacks. Sorry, my dear, but... I could not bring your suitcase. Freight train left a box of provisions, and I had too much to carry. But I have no other clothes to wear. And we'll take care of that. Uh, come with me to your room. Over there, 
in the trunk, Julia. Open it. But these are Aunt Julia's clothes. I can't wear anything like this. Uh, look down further. You'll find something. Oh, what an elegant cashmere sweater. And these skirts, just the kind they're wearing today. Yes, there were plenty of things in that trunk I could wear. Even a denim wraparound for gardening. Then, at the very bottom, I came upon a long sequin evening gown. And pinned to it was a note which read, This is the dress I want to be buried in. What has our Julia gotten herself into? Even her clothes are no longer her own. The aura around Caleb and his house grows ever more ominous, as you'll discover when I return shortly with Act Two. As the days slipped by, oblivion cast a strange spell of lethargy over Julia. For a time, she offered to help her uncle carry her suitcase up the stairs, and then forgot all about it. She even lost all curiosity about what was behind those closed doors. Caleb, too, seemed far more relaxed. They spent many happy hours together in the garden, and Julia became engrossed in the study of herbs. She had grown fond of her Uncle Caleb. But this false sense of peace was abruptly shattered early one afternoon when Julia was alone in the garden. Hello? Hello in there. Oh, John, of course he's not here. It's Wednesday. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Let's go around back and see what the old buzz has been up to in his garden. John, look. Somebody's there. It's a woman. Now, don't frighten her. Uh, excuse me, miss. Oh. I'm sorry. We, we came by to say hello to Caleb. People. <laughs> yes. We're people, but you're looking at us as though we were ghosts. But, uh, we, how? Oh, well, we're just the summer folks from down the hill. Uncle Caleb never mentioned Caleb, you. he's your uncle? Well, he, he never mentioned you either. Well, I'm here on a visit, but I thought this was... The only house around for miles and miles. Well, it is, except for our cabin. I haven't seen any cabin. <laughs> Halfway down the stairs. Oh, yes, I saw a path. Well, you follow that way into the woods, and there we are. For three months of the year, anyway. Only this year, Caleb's in for a surprise. We told him we weren't coming. I see uh, Caleb has put you to work in what Emily and I call his cemetery. Oh, I thought that at first. I guess it's because of those two rocks that look so much like tombstones. I have an idea they are tombstones. Uh, let's go inside, shall we, until Uncle Caleb comes home. I don't think we should be snooping around this way. Now, aren't you afraid to stay in this spooky house? That, that skeleton would be enough to turn me off. Don't tell me there's a skeleton in one of the closets. Oh, not in the closet. He rolls it around on a coat rack kind of thing. It must be one of the surprises behind this closed door. How do you know so much about this house? When we first came here, Caleb showed us all over the place. I think he was trying to frighten us. <laughs> but we don't scare very easily. The old man never talks about himself. But he's a good neighbor. Except when he has visitors. Then he doesn't want anyone else around. Why? I don't understand. Well, neither do we. I've been meaning to ask Caleb if I could paint that marvelous view from his guest room. But of course, now you're staying there... Oh, I'm not in that room. Oh, well, where are you staying? Up the hall on the other side, looking into the garden. Oh, well, then maybe Caleb will let me paint in the guest room this year. I'm sure he will. But you keep calling it the guest room. My uncle never wrote about any visitors. Were there many? Since we've been coming up, there were just that older man. And the boy. When was this? Oh, the man was here about four or five years ago. Isn't that right, Emily? I'd say so. And then he was gone, and we saw the boy two years ago. Nobody here last summer. I wonder who they were. Well, I thought maybe the boy was your brother or, or nephew. He called him Uncle Caleb, too. But that's very puzzling. Hmm. 
Say, I'd like to go down the hall and look at that view again. The light should be just right. Oh, um, I, I don't want Uncle Caleb to come back and think that we're... Uh, but he won't be back until after 3 o'clock. Now, we can hear the train when it goes by. Well, this must be when. <laughs> so you've forgotten what day it is, too. <laughs> they just all blend together. <laughs> you know, Uncle Caleb has... A built-in time clock, even though he doesn't remember dates. <laughs> He's down at that station every morning when the freight train comes through. And then one day a week, he waits for the passenger train. Come along, then. Let's take a look at that view. Look at those peaks. Mm. I know just the purple I'm going to use. Yeah, I'd forgotten how great it is. Mm. This room. A man and a boy. I found a pair of jeans in here. Well, now, you may be forbidden to open closed doors, but I'm the nosy type. Can't resist closets. Let's see what's in here. Well, look. It's filled with clothes. Men's work suits. And this old, old jacket. But it's not Uncle Caleb's size. Uh, and no one but a teenager could wear these. Well, I'll be damned. There goes the train. Yeah. Uncle Caleb will be back soon. Well, it'll take him a while to climb the stairs. Now, how do you feel about opening dresser drawers? Oh, no, no. I'm afraid to after what I found in the drawer in my room. Okay, it's my turn. Here goes. Men's work gloves. Socks. Here's a jackknife. Wait a minute. Here's something interesting. The wallet. And it's empty. Except for this sort of ID card. Let's see. Name, James J. Flanders. Address has been crossed out. Date of birth, this is almost illegible. It looks like 1900. Well, that has to be old Jim. Isn't that what he said his name was? Mm -hmm. If he were alive today, his age would be... What makes you think he's dead? Well, because this is his wallet. And in there, all his clothes... But the boy's clothes are there, too. Why didn't he take them with him? Look, we have to get out of here. Your uncle will be coming home, and I'm sure he'll be angry to find us talking to you. We were in the living room, and they were about to leave. John had already opened the front door, and then we heard... Julia! Julia! We hurried Help to the top me. of the stairs to find Uncle Caleb doubled over, ashen-faced, and struggling to breathe. <laughs> It's been a bad day. Trouble on the tracks. Caleb, it's John and Emily. What can we do? Just help me into the house. Uh, I'll be all right in a minute. John and I supported my uncle, walking him slowly to the house. When I suggested going straight to his bedroom, he protested so vehemently, we eased him into a chair near the fireplace. Well, young fella... What are you doing here? We're back at the cabin for the summer. Yeah? What happened to your trip to Europe? I had to give it up. But you didn't come in on the three o'clock. No, no. We got here yesterday. Uh, not on the freight train, you didn't. No, we backpacked. Somewhere? We left the car at Bearsville. I see. Uncle Caleb's head drooped forward, and he was seized with a violent coughing. I'd already loosened his collar, and now I tried to rub his chest. Uncle Caleb, you must have some digitalis. Where is it? Fox Club. In that jar on my big table. The little valley. Put it in some water. And John and Emily, you can help me to my room. I, I must lie down. I put water on the stove and found the bottle labeled Lily of the Valley Root. With shaking hands, I measured a very small portion into a cup of hot water and took it down the hall to my uncle's bedroom. Uh, oh. It's all right, my dear. Oh. Oh. I wanted to spare you for a little while, but you'd see it sooner or later. I was seeing it then. The walls and floor were black, and so was the big bed with a prow like a Viking ship. My uncle looked like a ghost propped up against those white pillows. And thank heaven, John had warned me 
because there, on one side of the bed, was that coat rack thing from which dangled a full-size skeleton. Don't be frightened, my dear. You'll soon get used to everything around here. Uncle Caleb needs a doctor. How do I get one? No way. Not up here. But there's a telephone down at the station. Yes, but no passenger train until next week. You have to tell the train company that Uncle Caleb won't be able to... Oh, you'd be surprised. He's a sturdy old man. And he's had these attacks before. I'll flag down the freight train tomorrow. But, Julia, shouldn't be left alone with him. I think we should stay here. You're darn right we're going to stay. But I'm not helpless, really, I'm not. I've taken care of my father for the last three years. Frankly, I'm worried, Julia. Now, what if your uncle is... He is only pretending to be sick. How can you say that? You saw for yourself. I've seen other things, too. Like what's down in the basement. Look, you've both said that. What is down in the basement? There are two carved gravestones. That doesn't surprise me. But one has the name Caleb, and the other name is Julia. Doesn't that tell you something? Yes. Uncle Caleb told me that one day he would rest peacefully in the garden behind this house next to his Julia. But, but that's you. Oh. Now I see what's troubling you. He met his wife, my Aunt Julia. I'm beginning to think her remains may already be in the garden. I wonder. Julia! Where's my Julia? I hurried to Uncle Caleb's room. Feeling better? Yes. Yes, my dear. Do you remember that time when you were feeling so very ill and I asked what you'd like for supper? Oh, that must have been Aunt Julia. Then you looked at me so sweetly, just the way you're looking now. And I said, i will do anything in the world for you, Julia. Anything to help you. And I'm sure you did. Always tried to... Tried to help people like Jamie and Robin. Oh, John. John, let's, let's go back in the house. All right. Oh. I'll leave the shovel here. But that's all the proof I need. It's horrible. But what are we going to tell Julia? John, all that dirt. Where's he been? Sit, uh, sit down, Julia. There's, uh, there's something we've got to talk about. No, don't tell her, John. Arnie, you have to get away from this evil place. Oh, stop it, both of you. My uncle may be eccentric, but he's a kind, gentle old man. Yeah, I used to believe that, but no more. We're letting our imaginations run away with us. But, Julia, I have the proof. Proof of what? I remembered that four years ago, there was only one stone in the backyard. Then, last year, the smaller one had been added. Go on. So, I took a shovel and went out just now. Oh, you had no right. I didn't dig down very far. Just far enough to establish that... Two wooden coffins are buried out there. One of them is about six feet long, big enough for a man, and the other is smaller. Just about the right size to hold a boy. Now, what do you think of the kindly Uncle Caleb? It's true that Julia was ready for adventure, but she has no intention of taking her dead aunt's place. Eccentricity is one thing, but the way things are shaping up, Caleb could be a scheming old man. Or else something has snapped in his brain, and he has lost all sense of reality. In either case, Julia appears to be in a dangerous predicament. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. has been confronted with some highly incriminating evidence against her uncle. If there really are two bodies buried in his garden, shouldn't the police be summoned? 
John, who made the discovery, is all for placing a telephone call at the railroad station to give a report on what he has found. But Julia is surprised at her own reaction. She feels protective toward her uncle. And although one might think she'd be grateful to have friendly neighbors, she finds herself resenting their interference. Don't you see, Julia? It's our duty to turn your uncle in. You don't know what you're talking about. After what I've uncovered? You have found nothing. You call two coffins nothing? None of us knows what's in those coffins. Well, I can certainly find out in a hurry. I forbid you to destroy my Uncle Caleb's garden. Julia, you're beginning to sound as as bad as... Oh, I'm sorry. I realize you've been through a lot. And you're not thinking straight. I know my uncle better than you do. I'm thinking that the smaller coffin may contain the remains of my Aunt Julia. And the other one? It's just like Uncle Caleb to be saving that one for himself. Well, there's another way to find out. You're right. Let's just ask Uncle Caleb. But if he's really sick? I mean, when he gets stronger. In the meantime, I suggest we have some supper and then you can go home. There's really no reason for you to spend the night. We're staying. John, I want to thank you and Emily for what you've done to help me and Julia. I was lucky we were here. Very lucky. Because I have another favor to ask. My niece won't let me out of bed. Uh, The 11 o'clock freight will be going straight through. But if they should slow down, then I don't want them to think no one's minding the store. Oh, I plan to be there when the train comes through. But they won't be stopping today. I'm going to flag them down. No need to do that. Emily and I need groceries. I want to place an order. Well, freight company won't like it. Plenty of groceries here. I'll place a big order later on. I'd rather do it myself, the way I used to. Times have changed. But if the train does stop... Tell them I'll be back on the job tomorrow. I'll be off. Oh, I'll go halfway down the stairs with you. I want to check up on the cabin. It's good to have you here to look after us, Cal. (laughs) I like being called that, Uncle Caleb. Why, uh, what did I call you? A girl. Well, of course. And that's what you'll always be. It's why I I don't like to burden you with my problems. If there's anything you want to tell me, Uncle Caleb, you know I'll always listen. But it's just that if anything should happen to me, I want you to make certain that my Julia and I lie side by side, just as we always do. You mean in the garden? Yes, Yes, I've left instructions in my will, but I'll feel so much better knowing a member of the family will take care of things personally. Well, of course, Uncle Caleb. You can count on me. But you know, you hadn't told me that Aunt Julia is already buried in the garden. Oh, she isn't, Julia. Not by herself. We'll go together. But where is she? She's there, in that handsome urn, on my bedside table. Mercifully, it was several hours before John and Emily returned. I'd calmed down and decided it was not yet time to give them this latest bit of information. John would be all too eager to rip the covers off those coffins, and there was no need to hurry. The dead could wait. Hi, Julia. How's your uncle? Resting comfortably, thank you. Well, where do you get that gaudy thing? <laughs> Down at the cabin. It's an extra calendar. I thought you'd better start keeping track of the days. I've circled today's date. Well, thanks very much. And here's a bag of oranges. The brakeman threw them off to me. Then you did stop the train. You bet I did. Had a talk with the engineer. He says there's no reason to have a station at Foothill Junction. And before long, any switching will be done by automation. That means Uncle Caleb will be out of a job. Well, okay, Julia. I didn't make any telephone calls. Kept my part of the bargain. What about yours? Please. 
Give me just a few days more alone with my uncle. I'm sure there's an explanation. I put off asking Uncle Caleb any questions until one morning. I found him in the guest room admiring the view. He sat in a rocker stroking crepe hanger curled up in his lap. Uncle Caleb, hmm? You know a man named Flanders. Flanders? Mm -hmm. No, can't say I know anyone by that name. Try to remember. James J. Flanders. Why, you don't mean Jamie, do you? I don't know. Who's Jamie? Oh, poor Jamie. He's dead. Very nice man. He stayed in this room, didn't he? And Jamie loved this room. But how did you know he was here? We found a wallet. In that dresser, with his name on it. We? Now, uh, who do you mean by we? Well, I should say John found the wallet. But they knew about Mr. Flanders. I didn't. Just what did they know about him? Only that he was staying with you one summer. How did you meet him? Meet Jamie? Mm-hmm. Uh, they rolled him off the freight one winter morning about five years ago. Oh, uh, poor derelict man. Thin as one of the rails he was riding. And you brought him home? True gentleman, if there ever was one. But the sickness had gone too far. Jamie didn't have long to live. You took care of him? Oh, I, I gave him food and clothes. His strength came back, and we thought he was going to be well. But it came too late. He loved it here, and he wanted to stay. I see. So you buried him in the garden? Well, it's where he wanted to be. Uncle Caleb, there are two unmarked gravestones in your garden. Oh, so you know about Robin, too? I know nothing about Robin. Dear Robin, I found him in the woods nearly starved to death, and it was October. A boy. Way up here. Where did he come from? From Bearsville. No. You don't mean that he escaped from that mental institution? That was no place for a bright boy like Robin. Oh, Uncle Caleb. You can't just take in a boy who's a runaway. And why not? He needed a home. But didn't they look for him? Oh, yes, but I hid him in the basement. I don't know what to say. How long did this boy live with you? Nearly a year. I tried so hard to help him. But, well, he must have been sickly from the time he was born. It was too late to save a small soul who'd been abandoned when he was a baby. Uncle Caleb, when you say you helped him, do you mean that I you... mean I gave him love and the only home he'd ever known. That's why Robin must never be taken away. I realized if it were not for John and Emily, I too might sink completely under the spell of this place called oblivion. Reluctantly, I went halfway down the stairs for the first time since I had climbed to the top and followed the pathway to the artist's cabin. You believe everything he told you, don't you, Julia? I have no reason to doubt anything he says. I think it's the perversion of a demented mind. John, don't say that. There's no harm in trying to help people. My uncle did nothing wrong. Nothing wrong? He may have murdered two people, possibly more. My uncle could never commit a crime. It's a criminal offense to harbor fugitives. And no sane person buries bodies in the backyard. Now, what are we going to do? You're not going to do anything. I'm taking a trip to Bearsville. You mean you're turning your uncle in? No. I'm going to tell them about that poor boy. And if he had no family, I'm sure well, that... What we... about the man named Flanders? Well, I'll, I'll get legal advice. Well, you better that. let me handle Take it. Take it easy, John. This is Julia's problem. All right, all right. But if she doesn't come back with some straight answers, I'm going to the authorities and tell them exactly what I think. 
It was a week to the day since Uncle Caleb's heart attack. He had been doing a little work in the garden and showing signs of restlessness. Emily had come over, I suspect just to check up on us. It was nearly 11 o'clock in the morning. Julia, what, what day is today? Well, let's see. Where's the calendar I brought you? Uh, Harry, I have to know. Now, the day you circled Emily was Saturday. So, uh, it's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Today is Wednesday. I should have known. I have to get down to now, the station. Now, don't worry, Caleb John's there. You don't understand. I have to go. I have to do it. Do what? The switch. I have to throw the switch before the train passes the station. My jacket. Where, where, where's my jacket? Just a minute, Uncle Caleb. You're not going anywhere. It should have been fixed long ago. I told them the last time. I'll go down the stairs with a message. No one else knows what's wrong. I'm the only one. You're not well enough. Not down that long flight of stairs. Last week, trouble with the switch. It, it jammed, and I threw the emergency for the passenger train. But the passenger train doesn't get here till three. That should be plenty of time. No. Oh, the way it's set now, the, the freight will go through on the passenger tracks. And about 20 miles from here, there'll be a head-on collision. But there must be some way that you could... The freight doesn't slow down on Wednesdays. I am the only one knows about that switch. I, I must hurry. We're right with you. Now let go of me. I can't be late. Broken switch. Let go of my arm. I must move faster. Faster. No one must be hurt. No one will be when I... I have to go. He made it. <laughs> Caleb, stop the train. I know. He said he had to do it. John? John, everything's all right now, isn't it? Go on back up the hill, both of you. There's nothing you can do. Oh, then we don't need to give you the message? What message? About the switch, the broken switch. Switch? So that's why he did it. That's exactly why. He should have told me last week. Where is Caleb? I suppose there was no other way. No other way to stop that freight train. Caleb threw himself across the track. Uncle Caleb's death, like his wife's, was dedicated to helping people. Perhaps on the evidence you believe that, or if you have a different kind of imagination, you may believe there was a darker side to his nature. That's up to you. As for Julia, I'll tell you about her in just a moment. left everything he possessed to Julia. And she, too, had fallen in love with that mountaintop. Oh, uh, she reported the deaths of Jamie and Robin, but uh, since no one claimed them, they rested in peace beside Caleb and Aunt Julia in the garden, where they all wanted to be, in oblivion. Our cast included Anne Shepard, Guy Sorrell, Mary Jane Higby, and Nat Polan. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Killed Cyrus Darrow, but I didn't. You did, son. Big hole in his forehead caused by the forcible entry of a pistol ball. Yeah, there, there must be some mistake. No, sir. There's no mistake. This here, this your pistol? Yeah, of course it's my pistol. It was found 50 yards away from Cyrus's house. No, you couldn't have found it 50 yards away because... Because? Well, be... It can't be my pistol. I, I remember. I put it back in my bag. Yeah? Yeah. Hey. Hey, it isn't here. Of course not. How could it be in that bag and in my hand at one and the same time? No, I, I never... I didn't... Mr. Jones, as sheriff of Springfield County... I hereby arrest you for the murder of Cyrus Darrow. What? And may the Lord have mercy on your soul. What are you saying? Well, that's right. That's right. I shouldn't say that just yet. After all, you ain't been tried. But you'll get a fair trial before they hang you. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... Episode of 
Radio Mystery.